Welcome back, everyone, to a psalm for every season. We are now in the middle of a wonderful set of psalms where God is brought to our attention front and center as the great King and the great Lord of the universe, ruling, reigning, high above every nation, high above every person, high above everything that there is in all of creation. God rules and reigns high above all of it. That's what's in this small set of psalms. And we see in this small set of psalms that he is not passively engaged in his creation. He's the furthest thing from passively engaged. He's not like the classic watchmaker. You ever heard that illustration before? The watchmaker who creates and then who puts the watch up on the shelf and just lets it run and do his thing. No, God is not like that. He's a God who plans, a God who acts, a God who rules, a God who sustains. And this particular group of Psalms instructs us how it is that we should worship such an awesome God. So, Today's psalm is 97, and it begins with these words, The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. The Lord reigns means that the Lord is king, right? Yahweh Malach is the two Hebrew words. The Lord is king. He reigns as an infinite king, as an eternal king. He reigns because he has power beyond any measure or any degree. And when we talk about the reign of God and his kingship, we automatically have to start talking about something called his sovereignty. If I asked you this question, which of God's attributes is his greatest attribute? Some of you would say his holiness is the greatest attribute. Some of you would say his love is the greatest attribute. Some would say, no, it's his wisdom. And some would say this, and some would say that, and there are literally dozens upon dozens of different awesome divine attributes that belong to God that set him apart uniquely and eternally as God. But there is a general consensus that one attribute is the key, and that attribute is his sovereignty. Sovereignty. Without possessing the attribute of sovereignty, God is not in charge, not really in charge, not in charge of his universe, not in charge of the world, and without his sovereignty, he would be unable to do what Ephesians 1 says that he does, and that's this, that he is working everything out in conformity with the purpose of his will to the praise of of his glory. Now that's a mouthful, but that's what Ephesians 1 says he is doing because he is sovereign. Without sovereignty, he would not be in charge of the world. Something else would. Now you tell me what's in charge of the world if it's not God. It's a ridiculous notion to even think about. Obviously, God is sovereign over the world. Sovereignty is the key. Also because it involves many, many other divine attributes. A sovereign God has to be all-knowing. And that means, well, that's, we always use the word omniscience when we talk about God being all-knowing. A sovereign God has to be all-powerful. Well, and we always use the word omnipotent to describe his power that is without limit. And a sovereign God has to be absolutely free to do whatever it is in his will, and we call that God's self-determination. So those who say that God's love is the most important attribute, you can't say that they're wrong, because God's love is indeed very important. But if God was not sovereign, then he might want to do loving and compassionate things, but he wouldn't necessarily have the power to do it. His sovereignty makes it possible to be loving, to be compassionate. Just like God's justice is really, really important. But if he wasn't sovereign, he might want to do things that are right and things that are just, both in this life 
and also in the life to come, because that's what God does in this life and in the life to come. He does things that are right and things that are just. He might have might not have the power to do that if he wasn't sovereign. It's sovereignty that makes it possible, and so on, and so on, and so on, down through the other attributes. And so that's why theologians tell us that the sovereignty of God is the foundation. It's the center of gravity for Christian truth and theology. It is the sun around which all the other attributes of God revolve. They revolve around his sovereignty. Plus, on top of all that, brothers and sisters, it is the sovereignty of God that gives you and I tremendous, incredible comfort and strength and joy in every aspect of our life, that we just know that God is sovereign over everything and that we serve him and that he's our father in heaven. That's the thing that gives us incredible comfort and strength. So everyone, please listen when I say, smile when you say or you hear someone say, the Lord reigns. That's an incredible statement. That's why it says, the Lord reigns. What should the earth do? The earth should be glad. And the distant shores, which is the Psalms way of saying the most distant places, they should rejoice because the Lord reigns. During the days of Oliver Cromwell, uh, England was in tremendous turmoil. I don't know how many of you are, are love English history. Uh, I think a bunch of you do. Just ask Patty. He will stand up and start lecturing right now on it. But anyways, England was in great turmoil during the days of Oliver Cromwell, and its future as a nation was up in the air, if you can imagine that. Well, there was a certain high official in the government, and his name was Bolstrode Whitlock. What a name, Bolstrode Whitlock. And he worked directly with Oliver Cromwell. And with all the craziness going on at the time, Mr. Whitlock had many, many pressures placed upon him. For one thing, he had 16 children. 16 children. But the bigger pressure that he had was that England was falling apart at the seams. Shortly before a trip to Sweden, Mr. Whitlock could not sleep. He had a servant who was traveling with him, and the servant took it upon himself to offer his boss some helpful advice. And he said, Mr. Whitlock, sir, do you mind if I ask you a question? Mr. Whitlock said, go ahead. He said, sir, do you think that God governed the world very well before you came into it? And he said, well, I'm sure he did. The servant continued, do you think, do you think that he will govern it very well after you've gone out of this world? Mr. Whitlock said, of course he will. Well then, sir, the servant added, please excuse me, but do you not think that you may trust him to govern the world while you are still living in it? Mr. Whitlock did not say a word. He just rolled over in his bed and fell asleep. We look at the world in November of 2023, and we say, it is just terrible what's going on. Doesn't matter where you look. Look at the homelessness. Look at the cost of groceries. Look at the wars and rumors of wars. Look at the crime. Look at all this woke nonsense. Look at all the laws being passed. And this world has gone utterly mad. It's going to you know where in a handbasket. We all say it. And it may be true. But God has managed so far. And he will continue to manage after we are gone, and his sovereignty is the key. A friend of Martin Luther's in a letter said, I am glad that Christ is Lord of all, otherwise I should be utterly out of hope. Those are powerful words. And that's exactly right. If our eyes are only fixed on the world around us, that's the place where we will be. We will be utterly out of hope. 
if our eyes are just fixed on this world around us and all we do is listen to the six o'clock news and then the 11 o'clock news and then the 7 a.m. news and then the noon hour news. Oh. But if our eyes are on God, the King, the sovereign one, the great and awesome God, then our hearts will be able to find some comfort and joy. There is no doubt about it. We don't understand everything God is doing, do we? No. We don't understand everything that God is allowing to happen on this earth, do we? But then why should we? We're not God. Why should we? We couldn't possibly think his thoughts or know what he knows. What we are able to do is trust him because he is sovereign. The Lord reigns. Smile. The Lord reigns. Be glad. And now because the Lord reigns, Psalm 97 brings forward something else. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. That's good news. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. This paragraph is the paragraph that sets this psalm apart from the other psalms in this group in the 90s of psalms. Clouds, thick darkness, fire, lightning, trembling, a consuming fire, melting mountains, his visible glory. These things are also an aspect of his sovereignty. It's an aspect of his sovereign reign. It is what human beings feel and see when God reveals himself. Compare this paragraph with this paragraph when God met the Israelites at Mount Zion. They had just gone out of Egypt and they were supposed to have this big summit meeting with God at Mount Sinai. And this is what happened just before God gave them the Ten Commandments. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from the furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Notice all the same key words are in that paragraph. Thunder, lightning, thick cloud, trumpet blast, trembling, smoke, fire, violent trembling. It even says that Moses trembled uh, in that passage that Babette read this morning. Moses trembled when he came near the living God. Um, we know that in other parts of the scripture, Isaiah, when he met with the living God, it says that he said, I am undone. Uh, when Ezekiel did, it says that he fell down on his face. When Daniel did, it says that he turned pale. When Habakkuk did, it says that his heart started to pound out of control. The point is, and the title of today's message is, there is a sheer awesomeness to God in his kingship, in his sovereignty, in his majesty. Awesomeness that is so profound and so powerful that it does a number on us human beings. It's just too bad, you know, that the word awesome has become so trivialized. Would you like a cookie with your cup of tea? Oh, yes, please. That would be awesome. Awesome. It's like we are living in the Lego movie where everything is awesome. Everything is awesome. 
The problem is when everything is awesome, including cookies, then nothing is awesome anymore. But there's a sheer awesomeness to God. And that is the forgotten aspect of his kingship. People have become, as you well know, casual towards God, superficial and shallow to the level of blurting out, oh my God, this, oh my God, that, a hundred times a day. Apparently to many, God is not awesome. Not awesome. But don't worry about it too much. Just because the world has trivialized uh, his awesomeness, he is still awesome. He is still a consuming fire. He is, he is still all of this in Psalm 97. He can melt the Rocky Mountains. No problem. No problem. The whole Rocky Mountain range just melt like wax. His lightning can still light up the entire world all at once, and it will. It will. And the heavens still proclaim his righteousness. All you got to do is look outside, and the peoples will see his glory, and they do. This is still the awesome God with which we have to do. This is still the awesome God who we need to answer to. So we remind ourselves in this world when everything is awesome, then nothing is awesome. We remind ourselves, let's not treat him so lightly. One of my favorite pastors and theologians said, the ease with which some people approach God and speak of God is not a sign of their deep acquaintance with God, but rather a sign that they hardly know God at all. Next in the psalm comes this familiar reminder that we've seen a number of times that all who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols, worship him, all you gods. As we saw in last week's psalm, if there is one God and one God only, and there is, and if all the other idols and all the other gods in this world are actually the strict definition of an idol is a no thing, it's a no thing, it's a nothing, and if this God is the creator of everything and everyone on this, in this universe, and if this God is our Redeemer and our Savior for those who will turn to him, then above everything else, he alone deserves our exclusive worship. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for how long? Forever. Amen. In the prime minister's office, there is one prime minister. In the Oval Office, there is one president of the United States. In Beijing, there is only one president of the People's Republic of China. And seated high above the circle of the earth, beyond our galaxy and beyond the countless trillions of other galaxies that are out there, there is but one God, the only God, the living God. I can't wait for our home group to study Isaiah 44 and 45, we're almost there, where the Lord speaks and he says this, is there any God beside me? No, there is no other rock, I know not one. There is none besides me, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior, there is none but me. It's, it's, it's like God is up there in the heavens looking around. Nope. <laughs> nope. Looking from one end of the universe to the other. I'm it. When you consider the sovereignty of God and his kingly power and his sheer awesomeness, that singular command makes total sense. Worship the Lord and worship him only. Total sense. And yet, strangely enough, idols continue to proliferate. What's an idol? An idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything that you seek to give to give you what only God can give. The idol of self, the idol of status, the idol of popularity, the idol of sex, the idol of technology, the idol of money and materialism. We 
well know that the people of the world sell their souls to idols constantly. But the sad thing is when a Christian would do the same, sell their soul to an idol. Why is that? Why would a Christian want to worship any one of the idols that I just mentioned or any other idol? The answer is located in the heart of Psalm 97. It's because we know so little of the one true living God. We didn't even know that he is awesome. We didn't even know that he's a consuming fire. And the reason, of course, that there's so little knowledge of the true God is there's so little knowledge of the Bible and of prayer and of worship. This calls for repentance, and it calls for back to the Bible, our food and drink. The last paragraph of the psalm returns to another familiar theme, and that is the righteous judgment of God, but with a bit of a twist. Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods, all no things. Zion is rejoicing. Zion is an Old Testament word for the people of God, so that's us. And the villages of Judah are rejoicing. And the reason we're all re they're rejoicing in this little section here is because God has done something. God did something. He intervened. Uh, he brought a judgment. He brought some justice. He established something of his righteous kingdom, and so the people are happy. That's why they, they, they're rejoicing. They're glad. The thing is, we don't know what the historical setting was. We don't know what the situation was. We don't know what it is that God did. It doesn't say. And it doesn't even matter. Because every time God intervenes with his righteous judgment, we have a reason to rejoice. We call righteous judgment by many different names. We call it his blessings. That's a common phrase. We talk about God's blessings in our lives. Uh, we call them answered prayers. We call them signs of his kingdom. Some even call them coincidences. But whatever you call them, they foreshadow the great and final righteous judgment that is yet to come when Jesus Christ returns to this earth to establish his kingdom at the end of the age, and then we will see perfect justice and perfect judgments. In 2023, there's no such thing as perfect justice. We just get scattered hints of justice. We just get signs of his kingdom here and there. We just get showers of blessing here and there. We just get answered prayers here and there, but it's not perfect justice. As you look around and still today, the poor are disadvantaged. Still the homeless are caught in this cycle of despair. The unrighteous are still being elevated and celebrated and thrown millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, more, more, more. And the innocent are still being slaughtered by the tens and hundreds of millions in the place that should be the safest place on earth, in the womb. And we look around and we see identity politics has conned the masses to accept pure nonsense and complete lies and the righteous are viewed as people from another planet. But when Jesus comes in his power and awesome glory to bring judgment and justice and righteousness, it'll be perfect. Everything that he brings will be perfect. The humble will be lifted up. The helpless will be defended. Liars will be exposed. The guilty will be judged. The wicked will be brought down, way, 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 way down. And great will be the rejoicing of God's people. There will be rejoicing in Zion. There will be gladness in the villages of Judah because of the perfect judgments of the Lord. And that is something truly awesome. We're not used to using the word judgment in association with something that causes joy. But what we see in these Psalms throughout the 90s 
and even before that, over and over again, is that judgment, when God judges, it's a good thing. And here in the Psalms, we're told that he's coming. He's coming to make everything right. And of course, we believe that Jesus is coming again. And when he does, he will make everything right. Now, the people of God, we have nothing to fear from his judgments. We're saved to the uttermost by the blood of the Lamb. Sins forgiven, sins burned up. Burned up our sins are. Dressed in white, carrying lamps that are burning bright. We await our King who's coming soon, and we await with joy. And so the final verses of this psalm bring practical encouragement for people like us, people like us who are very much alive in 2023 and living in bad times surrounded by all kinds of evil things. It's one thing to say the Lord reigns when you're up in heaven, and they are saying it up in heaven, the Lord reigns. It's another thing to say the Lord reigns when you're here on the earth and there's so much evil and there's so little righteousness and the swamp has not yet been drained. So the final verses, just coming up now, I'll warn you, they tell us how we should live in these times. And look at the opening line. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. You haven't heard a sermon on that too often, have you now? For he guards the lives of his faithful ones, and he delivers them from the hands of the wicked. Light is shed upon the righteous, and joy, parenthetically, is shed upon the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. I think we've just found the commandment that is the most frequently broken. I think. To hate evil is to put yourself on the side of God. Isn't that the side we want to be on? If you want to be on his side, then you have to hate evil. And in these verses, God says that for those who hate evil... He will give you everything you need. He'll give you protection. He'll give you deliverance. He'll put light on your pathway. He'll put joy in your heart. And that sounds like a good deal in exchange for if you'll hate evil on this earth and not participate in it, I'll give you protection, deliverance, light in your path, and joy in your heart. That's what belongs to those who love the Lord. But to hate evil is not natural. Not for us human beings, it's not. Not natural at all. In fact, naturally speaking, we love evil. We are fascinated by evil. We are drawn to evil. Goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were perfectly happy and content. And then there was that tree over there called the knowledge of good and evil that was just so interesting. It's so attractive. It's just like, I mm, just love to get my hands on one of those. So, how do we hate evil? when we so naturally are drawn to it. The the difficult thing to say is this, that hating evil is a sign of conversion. To hate evil is a sign of conversion. It is To hate evil comes from God. It's a God-given gift. Three things for you to wrestle with. Number one, when you hate evil, you have to hate all of evil. You can't be selective. I hate this evil, this evil, this evil, but not this one. Number two, when you hate evil, you can't compromise with evil. It's a take no prisoners kind of thing. And then number three, when you hate evil, you have to hate it in yourself, first and foremost. That's really where the rubber meets the road. Hate it in yourself, first. Which takes us then to the fitting conclusion in verse 12, rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. If we don't praise God with joy on this earth, who will? If we don't praise God with joy now, when will we? Our God is an awesome God, and the vision in the last pages of the Bible is that 
all the saints in heaven will be gathered there looking down on the earth and they will be rejoicing in God's righteous judgments and justice and all the proper, good, excellent things that he did. And they'll be singing with joy and shouting hallelujahs because of it. And one day that huge group will include you and I. We'll see our awesome God face to face and we'll say hallelujah. The Lord reigns. The Lord God Almighty, he reigns. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this incredible, insightful psalm that tells us how to live in the world that we live in now. Lord, it's a world that you reign over, and yet we don't understand everything that goes on. But, Lord, we are called by you to be in relationship with you through Christ Jesus and to hate evil all around us and to rejoice that you are the God who brings judgments and who brings righteousness and who brings justice on the earth now and one day it will be perfect. And we look forward to it, Lord. We look forward to it. Help us, Lord, to, as we, uh, we've had our own consciences stung by this psalm, I think. Certainly mine has been stung. I pray that all of our consciences have been stung. Lord, to draw nearer to you, draw closer to you, take you more seriously, more seriously, Lord, than we are right now. And so help us, we pray, draw us to yourself by your grace and your power in Jesus' name. Amen.